Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and uh, in this video we're going to be talking about the 2021 game mode updates for A Song of Ice and Fire. But the first thing that I want to touch on before we get too deep into this is probably the most significant nerf in all of A Song of Ice and Fire history. So if you pay attention to the new releases, the stuff they're rolling out on the Greyjoys, and all of the new edits to the units, attachments, and NCUs and tactics cards that are coming about, you've probably let this one slip under your radar a bit. But in the 2016 rulebook, the Greyjoy symbol was previewed as um, a pretty cool teal color. And it looks like now they've changed that uh, logo to black. I do feel like this is the greatest travesty in the entire game. So back to the task at hand here. I wanted to talk about the 2021 game mode updates because it seems to be the most uh, complete thing that we've received from Cool Mini or Not with this new version that's coming along. The unit updates, the tactics cards, all of that other stuff is really important and it's going to change the way a lot of us play the game and interact with it. But uh, things are kind of coming out at a pace that are not uh it, we're not likely to get the full picture of that anytime soon but this game mode document we do have and game modes really alter the way that we all engage with the game so i figured it was good to start talking about it here and just kind of prepare people for some of those changes that are coming the first scenario up in the book is probably the one that most people consider the the basic scenario and that's a game of thrones the first things to notice on this one is that they've changed the layout for the objectives so that they're fixed. And this is something that I really appreciate in the game. I think that there's just another layer of complexity, not just for the players, but for tournament organizers to have to um, set up and tear down all these uh, objective things uh, at the beginning of each game. Uh, it's, it just kind of chunks things up a little bit. Plus, you can really punish new players by not for, by them not understanding where these things are really supposed to go for their army or the way to position them best to uh, stop their opponent from grabbing them early. So having them equally spaced out uh, and just having them standard, I think, is a really good thing. I don't like the random assignment of objectives anyways. The other really big thing to pay attention to here that's pretty present in almost all of these scenarios is that the deployment edges or the deployment zones have changed to 10 inches standard. Now that's really big for a Game of Thrones in particular because there were times where units would have uh, difficult difficulty fitting all together. So if you were a free folk player or something, you could easily accidentally crowd yourself out from being able to deploy them and then you'd have to march them on later in the game and it just kind of chunks you up a little bit. But now I don't believe there's a single way you could not deploy your entire army on a 4x4 and that's maybe even considering playing at 50 points. So I think 50 points could now just be played on a 4x4 and not have many issues at all. Especially with the way the points are going to be changing a little bit with these uh, units that are a little bit more troublesome, right? The scenario is largely unchanged in terms of how it functions. You still get your plus one point if your commander is sitting on an objective, and uh, there's still victory through combat with this one, which, just as an aside, it seems like victory through combat is just a rule on every single mission. Uh, it's no longer just a random, like, maybe it's there, maybe it's not thing. I think all of these, the way that I interpret it, have victory through combat as a condition. The thing you'll notice that is an actual change uh, that's a little bit larger is that there's no longer a, a committed objective card for the central objective in the game and that's because those cards have largely changed and we'll kind of get that towards the end of the video instead of touching on it now but I wanted to mention that because it was really the only thing that I could see from this outside of a lot of the deployment changes that really uh, shifted on this one. I think this will still prove to be like the go-to scenario for getting new players into the game and getting them to understand how things work. Next up is Clash of Kings, and I've made no made it no secret that this was easily one of my least favorite scenarios in the entire game. I just really did not like 
that the game kept going and going and going with all of these units com- coming back. You know, I, I I like to attrition to victory, and in this game, you just don't get to... In this game mode, you just couldn't get to do that. So when you look at the table, it looks like it's unchanged. It's still got the three objectives in the middle. It is a 10-inch deployment again. But now we've got some really interesting changes to it. First off, not all units come back. The only unit that gets to come back into play is your commander's unit. So we're seeing a lot more benefits still for having that commander on the table instead of on the NCU board. But the uh, first thing that you end up doing with this is another element of the objective cards is that you end up pulling out specific numbered ones. So they've numbered these cards. For this one in particular, it's 6 through 10. And those are displayed here. The gist with these is that you and your opponent, depending on who's got the first player uh, you know, clarifier, uh, get to alternate drafting out of these until both players have two of these cards. You then get to use these once per game on your commander's unit, and they, when you use the card on them, they're considered to be holding an objective just to make the card work. So you get these uh, twice-per-game abilities that can add some real oomph to your commander. And... Uh, and that ends up being really cool, especially since your commander can come back in this one, uh, so that if you don't use them right away, uh, you can uh, get the chance later on. When you do bring your commander back, they do get to come in your deployment zone or within six inches of a of a table or a flank edge. Sorry, not table edge, because you can't you just can't touch your opponent's deployment zone. For scoring, things get a little bit more interesting in this one. It feels like the game mode's a little bit more accelerated. The ways that you do it, first of all, you get points from claiming objectives. That's not that's not gonna that's not changed at all. But objectives controlled by your commander get you an additional point, which is pretty bog standard for most of these scenarios. The other big ones are that you score an additional victory point each time your commander's unit destroys an, uh, an enemy unit with an ability or an attack. So this one still has that victory through combat because there's no exclusion on it here. So every time your commander kills something, you're getting two points out of that. Additionally, there's another scoring method where you gain plus two victory points the first time the enemy commander is killed. And that's in addition to those uh, victory through combat points. So you could be, if you are focusing down on your uh, an enemy's commander unit, you could get a ton of points out of this. So you're kind of incentivized and de-incentivized for bringing a commander. Uh, you, If you don't bring one, you're taking away your opponent's ability to gain just a three-point gimme off of you. But if you don't bring one, you're definitely missing out on a lot of points between scoring and taking out units. I think that Clash of Kings definitely got reworked in a way where I really do enjoy this scenario and look forward to playing it a bunch. Next up is the Winds of Winter scenario. Now this one was quite contentious for a very long time. In its first iteration, it was really not a good competitive scenario. And in the second iteration that Kulminir not made for it, at least the big change, I felt like it got to be a lot more competitive. I've always been a proponent of Winds of Winter, especially with the changes that were made last time around, I think in the 2016 update or version 1.6, I can't remember which one it was. But uh, right now, I think the changes that have been done to this really put it into the realm of being able to be played in a competitive environment and not leave much room for discussion on that one. I mean, like, you could argue that it's still two variants, and if you just don't like having fun, then that's your business. But I think this scenario really blends, like, a casual experience and competitive one together that can really function in in a tournament scene. The first thing we'll notice about this scenario is that there are uh, the, the the objective setup from Game of Thrones is back in here, so we don't have that random objective thing anymore. So you can't like hide hide a, uh, objective tokens or anything. The other big thing about this that I think is going to cause people to play this less is that each player needs to have a secret mission deck with them, and I think they call them just mission decks now. But uh, already in my local community, some of my local players are very rarely ever even have just the standard objectives deck on them. So I think it might take people a little bit to get used to knowing that they should have one of these decks on them to make sure they can you know, play this mode whenever it comes up. The other thing that kind of changes with it is uh, just like the objective cards, the mission deck has an, uh, numbered cards with it. And you get to start the game with a card 11 and 12 in your hand. 
And those two are looking pretty cool. The mission 11 just says, when you reveal this mission, if you have less victory points than your opponent, you score one victory point and become the first player. So this is a nice rubber band card, and each player gets to start out with that. Mission 12 is, at the end of the round, for each objective you control, you score one. So this is just a, a really basic standard way to get some victory points. So if you are going and playing uh, towards those objectives, it's something that you can do relatively easy. After you've pulled out these two cards, each player gets to go through their deck and select four additional mission cards, making that hand of six. It's very important here that it says you go in and select those four other cards. That means there's no more random variance in what you pick for yourself. That was always people's problem with uh, Winds of Winter is that it was too random, and additionally some of those cards got a little skewy on the victory points. But now you actually get to go through and kind of construct your game plan, so I feel like a lot of the problems people had with Winds of Winter being in the competitive sphere are pretty much squashed right now because there's a lot of control in how you score these things. And if you pick a bad card, that's your fault because you 100% were the one who were you engineered your own demise in that one. You just weren't thinking clearly. Otherwise, the, this plays a lot like old Winds of Winter, but each player at the start of the round gets to reveal their mission card, and you have until the end of the round to try and score that, and if you don't, it's discarded. I mean, if you do, you get the victory points. No matter what, the card's discarded. You just uh, score those points, or you don't. So uh, that's kind of the gist for all of the things in here. The other business is, again, I don't know why I have to keep saying this, but uh, Victory through combat is still allowed in this, or is still active in this. Victory through combat's on every single one of these missions. I haven't found a single one that says victory through combat doesn't work on this. So you get your normal points and you get your victory through combat on this. It should lead to the game going pretty quickly instead of uh, some of these could get really drug out. Next up, we've got Dark Wings, Dark Words, and this scenario is not one that I had a whole lot of experience with when it first dropped. It just wasn't one that I engaged with often, and this time around, I think they've done a lot of improvements to it that can bring it into the competitive atmosphere. I still think, though, that this is probably going to become the, the new black sheep of competitive play, and people will poo-poo on it, but I do really think that there's a lot of control in this mission that make it so you can get it into the competitive atmosphere. The first thing you'll notice is that it has three scenario or three objectives in the middle, just like the Clash of Kings scenario. So this is going to push engagement towards the center. And uh, you end up only needing one mission deck between the two players on this one. So if somebody's wanting to play one of these mission style games and both players haven't presented a mission deck, then you've at least got this as a backup. I think it's really elegant to have this kind of inclusion in there to make sure that if some players are missing the elements for the game, then you can always have this happen if, uh, if you're really hankering for one of these mission card scenarios. The first thing that ends up happening here is you end up removing uh, mission card 10, 11, and 12 from the deck, so those are completely gone. They just don't work with the way that it scores. So the next thing that you end up doing is before deployment, you reveal two cards from the mission deck, and those go into this pool called the active mission pool. And then you also take another two cards and put those in the reserve mission pool. Now those uh, will naturally recycle starting on round three where you will pull the two active mission cards out and then put the two reserve mission cards in. The way that you interact with those outside of that though is by having the all NCUs gain an ability where they can exchange the, um, the, the zones effect with discarding one of the active mission cards and replacing it with a reserve mission card or discarding a reserve mission card and replacing it with a new one from the deck. On the table, commanders also get that ability as well, but they just have to forfeit their action to do so. This is a really unique uh, take on the Dark Wings, Dark Words uh, format that we'd seen before. I believe before it was that these things rotated quite furiously, and when that was happening, you really didn't feel like you needed to use that NCU ability at all. Plus, now we've got something for our commanders to do if uh, they're kind of just holding down zones. When it comes to scoring in this one, your, your mission cards will list the ways they can be scored, so that's pretty self-explanatory on how that active mission pool works. Those are the missions that you can score for that while they're up there. And uh, you also get to just base score objectives on this one. Unlike uh, Winds of Winter, you still get to uh, end your turn by uh, controlling an objective and scoring one point for that. 
Your commanders also get to score an additional victory point while they're sitting on those. And this is another one where you still have victory through combat, just like every single mission does now. The uh, interesting thing that I like about this is there's a lot of counterplay with these active mission cards. If you're say I'm playing against someone and one of the active mission cards up is one that they're going to score at the end of this turn and there's and they'll be able to get a huge push ahead forward all I have to do is say activate one of my NCUs and I can take that scoring opportunity away from them and even try and set myself up for one of the res the reserve mission ones so that when it comes in I can just kind of pull a switcheroo on them and take a ton of points away from them gain a bunch of points for me and that's a huge uh, point differential and uh, that adds a lot of strategy to this whereas uh, before it was a little bit more random especially with the redesign of the mission cards which we'll get to at the end but um, I think that this game has a lot more control and those are the reasons why I think that it can definitely be put into the com competitive sphere of discussion so I would I'm interested to see how people react to this one because I do feel like they've done so many things to this to make it a lot more uh, uh, you have a lot more agency in this scenario. Next up, we've got the scenario Honed and Ready. Now, this one uh, I haven't interacted with much at all, um, so this is kind of still fresh for me. Looking at it right away, it's got the objective set up for Game of Thrones, that five uh, central or the five uh, committed uh, objectives. But now we're bringing in some castle walls. You'll need two of them to place on the edges of the table on this one, so hopefully you haven't thrown all of those away but I'm sure that it's easy to just find something to put up instead of those if you uh, are not a Storm of Swords player. So the uh, scoring for this one is pretty basic. There's no extra objective cards that go on to these things. Um, you just get your one victory point for controlling one of the objectives. You end up getting two victory points if your commander controls it, so we've still got some more benefits for having that on the table commander. The interesting thing about the castle walls is that if you're scoring an objective that's on the edge of the table, not the center one, uh, while you when you score it, you end up taking d3 plus 2 hits. So that's a pretty interesting uh, element to this one. It's almost like uh, each, each army has like little rangers or something kind of posted out on the sides of these walls, and they're shooting at people who are taking these objectives. I think that's a really neat concept, and definitely makes it feel like you have a bigger fight for the middle. There might be some of these side objectives that get abandoned, but people who have more resilient armies that can hold off attacks from your opponent that are charging onto you with that objective, and then stave off the the fight from the castle wall shots, those are going to hold up really well on this one. And then there's going to be a lot of hubbub over that middle one, right? So uh, the other thing about this scenario that gets really interesting is that every single NCU ends up getting an ability that says when they claim the zone, they can replace that zone's effect with uh, sh uh, targeting one unit that's controlling an objective other than the center objective. And then they take D3 plus two hits as well. So uh, it's just this interesting way to kind of trigger out some extra hits, which is cool because uh, typically... Um, outside of some very specific scenarios in the crown zone, you don't really get to do damage to your opponent uh, with uh, with with your NCUs or scenarios. I mean, like, they, there's people that can do it, right? Like, there's pieces that can do it. But for the most part, we don't have that direct way without having them take a test. You know, these are hits that you generate that they have to save against. So I think this is a really interesting scenario and has, like, that... It's it's very basic at its uh, at its core, but then when you factor in this castle wall thing, it kind of really shifts the way you play uh, the game because you have to make sure that you get some resilient units out on those sides. But resilient units are also usually pretty slow, so it means they're not able to kind of uh, fade to another area of the game. Plus you get, you get uh, interesting engagements happening on those sides where you've got two units that are both wanting those objectives and they start fighting each other, but then you have them start taking shots from the... Uh, the walls too and uh, I just feel like honed and ready is like a really fluffy fun scenario that still has a lot of competitive merit to it I think that this one's going to really uh, shoot itself straight into the competitive scenario competitive play and be really fun for our casual audiences too 
Next up we have one of my favorite scenarios, A Dance with Dragons. I felt like this one was a really well-designed scenario that had some cool elements that adapted the way your units functioned, and it just felt really good. Plus I always liked the idea that A Dance with Dragons was, uh, you were carrying eggs, which I'm still kind of sad they didn't really officially come out and say that, but I know why they're just keeping the, the language basic. They will always be eggs in my heart. So the scenario is functionally unchanged. You still end up claiming these eggs or objectives and you put them on the unit. They end up being, they, they're unable to march and they have their speed down to two that can't be increased at all. So that's still the same. The thing that's different about this right now is they kind of alleviated an issue, which I think was short lived where people had a difficult time determining the order of the objective cards that they assigned to these because there was real no orientation uh, for the for the map or for the the scenario map compared to like who was player one and who, who was the first player and who wasn't because player a and player b were just kind of referential referential points instead of actual game terms so i think there was a small discussion on how that would go and some ambiguity there but they've wiped that out by just randomly assigning objective cards to the to the eggs now and i think that that's a smart way to go about it it does add a little bit of variance to things in here but not enough to make it to where people i don't think are going to kind of cast this down as not being a very competitive uh, scenario anymore. The holding of those objectives still has a lot of the same things to it, where if you fail a panic test, you end up dropping it. If the unit's destroyed, you end up dropping it. Um, but the, the new thing that I like a lot is if you're controlling one of these objectives and you get attacked, if that opponent has more ranks than you when they attack they just swipe that egg from you before it was you could you could sit there and grind down on like john snow veterans for turns and turns and turns on their one rank and never get that egg away from them but now you're able to get that out really easily and i think the they're just the few changes to a dance with dragons uh only improved it. I still think it's one of my favorite scenarios in the pack, uh, even though Honed and Ready is kind of uh, doing it for me a little bit too. Even Clash of Kings, I think, gets up there. Like everything so far we've talked about has been really great, and I look forward to trying to play some more Dance with Dragons because I think it's a fantastic scenario. That's a good transition point for new players that are like tired of playing Game of Thrones one after uh, one after another and just kind of adapting something new to it. So we need to talk about Here We Stand Now. I love the namesake of this one. House Mormont is one of my favorite in the game, and it's really unfortunate that this is the scenario they end up getting. So far, it's been sunshine and rainbows with all of the scenario changes and the new scenarios that have been added to this game up to this point. And Here We Stand, it's going to... I'm kind of... I'm, I'm going to pee in these Cheerios a little bit. So I really didn't like clash of kings mostly for the returning of units at least in clash of kings you had multiple scoring elements that were not too difficult to work with although it was more of a trades game and it never it just kind of went to turn six and whoever had the most points took it because it was just so hard to get there so with uh here we stand those problems are a little bit exacerbated the you'll see the deployment is fire and blood style it's 18 inches from the from the table table edges so you've got this really uh, long deployment zone that closes the gap in the middle pretty quickly there's no scenario elements on here there's no objectives no no uh, terrain elements other than the ones you put on there but the table gets divided into four quadrants and this kind of turns into one of those classic war game things of quadrant control and uh, what ends up the way this ends up working is that you are considered to control the quadrant if you have at least five points in that quadrant and that's in, that's between units and uh, uh, attachments even and NCUs but we'll get to that later so if your opponent is in there you have to have at least five and more points in that quadrant than them as well so there's a little bit of a, a tug of war with committing points to zones to trying to get to score them uh, very, it's, it's a bit, like I said, it's that classic war game experience of quadrant control. You just got to have more stuff in there. And if your opponent's in there, you got to have more than them too. 
The interesting thing about NCUs is that instead of claiming a zone, they can be placed in a quadrant to then lend their points to that quadrant to help score it. You can only have one NCU in each quadrant, so you can kind of jump these around a little bit and kind of help uh, help your NCUs snipe out things that your opponents might might really think they're holding. So if you've got if they've got like a an eight point unit holding down the fort in one of their quadrants, and you just kind of march a five point unit in there, they will think that they've got that on lockdown but then you just throw your uh four point ncu in that zone now you've got nine points or in that quadrant i'm sorry you throw your ncu in that quadrant and now you've got nine points in there and your opponent just can't get anything there quick enough to kind of take that out so you could snipe these quadrants out from your opponent and it wouldn't be so terrible for commanders they end up adding three points to that total because commanders don't cost points, so they at least got that associated with them to let them lend their uh, their weight to scoring. So the, uh, the, the, the thing that makes this annoying for me, outside of, I think, quadrant control is just not good for wargaming in general, especially one like this, is that your units, all of your units, once they get wiped out, they come back. So we get that... Uh, we get that um, Clash of Kings feel from the olden days, right? And with no scoring elements outside of victory through combat, there's no objectives here, that you only get to score one point for each quadrant you control at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, round two. So this game turns into a really long grind, and the grind never ends because units just keep coming back from deployment zones or, or flank edges. And uh, it ends up, it feels to me like this scenario, at least in my head, is going to be you either lose this scenario horribly or win it de decidedly. You know, if, you, if you're, you, you, there's really not a whole lot of room for back and forth. I guess like maybe that's what I should say is you either table your opponent, you get tabled, or the game goes nowhere. There's not really a whole lot of like counterplay I think in a scenario like this I think I'll need to like definitely play some games of it to to really get an opinion on this one but just sitting on my theory throne I really think this is going to be the worst scenario in the entire packet and every time I come across it I will probably not like it I'd be interested to see what other people think of this if they have gotten a chance to play it already, um, especially with the way that the game's going to be changing a little bit where lethality goes down. I just feel like here we stand is going to be like here we dirtle. Next up, we've got a Feast for Crows. Now, this one didn't take a whole lot of changes, but there's some interesting wording in here that makes the scenario a little weird. So first up, it's we the scenario hasn't changed much in terms of deployment. I mean, we're at 10 inches instead of long range, but that's standard right now. The thing that I've enjoyed that they've cleaned up is they've, they've kind of fixed the confusion around how you place the objective tokens. Um, it looks like in the diagram, at least the one previously, it felt like the center of the objective was at short range, but now the full objective from one end to the edge of the table is at six, and then the corpse pile gets centered on that. So I appreciate the way that they did that, because I feel like there was a little bit of ambiguity on how you set those up before. Um, and it might, maybe you don't think there was, but I know that our group definitely had some. No, uh, no one Feast for Crows table was set up the same way it seemed. The uh, unique thing now that they've added in here is that each one of these objectives on the corpse piles gets a random objective card that goes on there, so that's going to be really nice and add some new diversity to this mission. The, uh, the things that I feel like, and maybe this might have been an issue before and I just never uh, quite realized it, was the, uh, the way the controlling the objectives goes. So let's say you have a unit holding an objective on a corpse pile. The way that you're oriented on that corpse pile, you are covering the entirety of the front of it with your base. So if your opponent charges you from the front, there's no way they can actually get onto that corpse pile. Now you've got your opponent sending a unit into your front. They attack you, you fail some saves, and then you fail your panic test. The stipulations of uh, a Feast for Crows used to be that in order to transfer control of that token after a failed panic test, you the opponent's unit would have to be touching that corpse pile. That stipulation's no longer in here, 
So your opponent, after you fail this panic test, would gain control of that token. And uh, the panic test is before the attack is completely resolved. So now after, the, after that's been transferred, when you fail the panic test, that is the event where your opponent then says, I've finished my action. The, the stipulation now, or well, one of the other stipulations in A Feast for Crows says that any opponent ending an action controlling an objective but not on the corpse pile that it's connected to then forfeits that token for their opponent to place. So you're, you have forced your opponent to, to take that token, and now you get to be the one that places it somewhere. If your unit hasn't activated yet, you can just place that somewhere around the underneath the your unit's base, just anywhere where they're on it. And then you just have to shift in combat, and shifts are considered moves. You have now ended a move on the on the token and the corpse pile. You pick that back up, and you're ready to score again for next turn. So I don't know if a feast for crows is broken because i feel like that is just not what the designers intended for this scenario but i do think that it's very gamey and uh i don't believe it's what they intended so i think that needs to change a little bit to make sure that you're not just automatically always going to get your token as long as you don't activate and uh and your and cover up the front end of those corpse piles so i'd be interested to see if coolman you're not kind of changes this one and rolls it back to what it used to be maybe they figured that it wasn't a really uh that it was maybe a super superfluous stipulation but i think that it's actually causing a really bad play experience that happens in a feast for crows and the first time somebody has this happen to them and they don't know that someone can do it they're going to really not enjoy it otherwise outside of that little interaction the rest of feast for crows is mainly unchanged and i still think it's a really great scenario and leagues better than what it was when it first came out i do hope that they kind of address this problem with a feast for crows scenario though i did forget to mention that this uh, this scenario also gained that uh, rule from a dance with dragons where if the attacker has more ranks than the defender uh then they'll claim the objective after attacking them. But that still kind of keeps this issue perpetuating of they take the objective, then you have to, then they have to give it back to you and then you can claim it again the next turn. So uh, again, I just, I do think there's this issue that needs to be resolved in here, but otherwise with that, when that gets fixed, I think this is still just a perfect scenario. The final scenario, final ish scenario in the packet is fire and blood. So the deployment on this hasn't changed at all. We've still got that long, 18 inch deployment on each side there's no scenario elements that start on the table there's no terrain elements that start on the table you still get to go through the marking process so that means that each each player gets two objective tokens they can assign those objective tokens to one unit from their opponent's army and they just kind of alternate back and forth until all those have been placed out it, each each player has two marked units essentially is what it is the gist with this that's changed a little bit is that as soon as you mark uh, one of your opponent's units, they get to go through and pick one of the objective cards, number 6 through 10, and then attach it to that unit that is marked, so they end up getting the ability on that. So we already have a, 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 a de-incentivization for being first player because as first player you're the person who gets to mark the first unit and that means that your opponent's going to be able to get their the, their favorite pick out of the five objective cards that uh, come out for abilities that go on that unit and as things go on you know those choices dwindle down but you have to be very careful on what units you mark now it can't just be uh, the most derpy unit out there because they're going to be getting some cool benefits to it I think that was one of the problems people had with fire and blood originally was that you would just take whatever the most uh ineffectual unit was and give them this token so that they could never really gain points off of that but at least now you've got the ability to um put some extra combat oomph on that unit to make sure that you can get some work done with that marked unit we still have the uh we still have the ability that your on the table commander gets where when they activate uh, they can select one enemy combat unit within long range to get a victory point placed on them. This is just another one of those uh, perpetual benefits that we get for having on-the-table commanders as opposed to NCU commanders. 
when it comes to scoring, we still have victory through combat on this one, so the points are going to rack up real quick here. And you end up getting uh, an extra victory point whenever a marked unit destroys an enemy unit with an action or ability, so that'll give you two points for everything you kill with marked units. You also gain two victory points when a marked enemy unit is destroyed, so if you are killing it with a non-marked unit, you get three points. And if you're destroying that unit with a marked unit, you get four victory points from that. So the things can stack up pretty quick here. And then on top of that, uh, you also get any victory points that the commander had put out on them too. So you can score a lot of points off of just one unit. This becomes a very bloody, very fast scenario. Uh, I remember one time when I played this with very... The rules haven't changed all that much in terms of how many points you get on things. But uh, we ended up finishing our game out by, I think, early turn three. Back when you just kind of ended the game when you had all the points. So I don't think that the pace on Fire and Blood has slowed down at all. I think that giving the marked units an extra ability to make it so that you, at least your basic Free Folk Raiders, are still getting some kind of cool thing like Sundering or Precision or Vicious. Um, I do believe that the Fire and Blood is still just going to be a really fun scenario, and a lot of people who had problems on it might see some of that alleviated a little bit with getting some extra combat output from those units. Next up, we've got Storm of Swords. Now, I've never played this scenario, and maybe someday in the future I'll play it on the channel, but this is your funsies. Let's have a very asymmetrical game. Uh, I don't think much of anything's really changed in this one, and if it has, it just goes to show my inexperience with this and my unwillingness to want to go back and read the original Storm of Swords to see if there is any comparison, but I do have one piece of advice for you on this one. Okay. So the last thing I'd like to touch on are the objective cards in the mission deck. When we look at the objective cards, you can see that there's a lot of the really devastating cards missing from this. Most of these are ways of altering units attacks or just getting some small benefits or bonuses in the game, which I really think is where objective cards needed to be. When we had things like scoring extra points off of them and shutting off NC user attachments, there's nothing more annoying than bringing your really awesome commander that you just spent a ton of time painting and trying to figure out how to play and pr you want to practice this one real hard and get the, get the gist for what they do on the table, and then your opponent just derps up six inches onto an objective and shuts your commander off for the rest of the game. That was how my first ever Rattleshirt game went, and forever I will know him as Rattleshirt and never as Lord of Bones because of that one soul game. So I really like the way that they've kind of streamlined and lessened the impact of the objective cards while still keeping them very relevant to the game and making you want to go for those and making sure the marked units gets things. I think the objective deck in general, all those changes are all extremely positive, especially since we look at taking out some of those really rough, big, impactful cards that were in the previous iteration. So the last thing I want to touch on then is the mission deck. So when I mentioned earlier that Dark Wings, Dark Words, and Winds of Winter were very much welcome in the competitive sphere now, at least in my opinion, not only did I base that opinion off of the added agency that players get through the changes to those scenarios, but I also base that off of the uh, way that the new mission deck is kind of structured. So we have very few cards that offer more than two points. I think it's only one, if I recall correctly. Uh, but we also have a, the, the altering to the uh, the big offenders, at least in my opinion, were the uh, the ones where you claim zones. So Alistair Florent uh, was probably the terror of these, these missions where if you scored ones or if you had one zone at the end of the turn, you got one point. And if you held a different zone, you got one point. But if you held them both, you got three. So that's no longer the case. And now those only happen when you claim them. So there's some interesting counterplay, at least in the world we live in right now, where NCUs could get pulled off of the zone. You could kind of claim something twice and get extra points off of it. But now Alistair Florent doesn't really get a whole lot of... Uh, business here because I believe his order, at least now in his current iteration, is going to allow him to uh, claim, when he when he claims a zone, he has to switch and doesn't, he isn't considered claiming that zone anymore, so you won't get to uh, kind of futz with the points on him, but of course that's depending on how he changes, right? You know, this could be obsolete by the time the Baratheon NCU changes end up hitting, so uh, 
suffice it to say there's a, a there's a lessened impact in the mission deck without losing too much to make the scenario feel like it's scoring so slowly. I know uh, I'd even tried a game of Dark Wings Dark Words when it first came out where the game was over by uh, early turn two uh, because of how quickly you can score these mission cards. So I, I do think that the mission deck really plays a lot into why I feel those scenarios are so important or so uh, functional right now, especially in that competitive zone. If you don't want to get them in tournaments, they're still really fun to play. I think that once people kind of warm up to them and mess around with them a little bit, they'll probably have a similar opinion. Now, I know this video was quite a long one, much like the other top five that I had done, but there's a lot to unpack in these scenarios, and I feel like I still just kind of barely grazed over them. Uh, I think that in the future, if people are having uh, particular issues with certain scenarios or feel like they need more information on some, I could probably do some focused videos on each scenario. But for right now, I liked kind of having this all compiled kind of visual podcast style for people to kind of absorb all this information and, uh, and really get their, or hit the ground running with these scenarios as soon as things start kind of rolling out. So thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.